So now Queen Kunti has just completed her prayers, and now the Lord is responding by acting. Thus, accepting the prayers of Srimati Kunti Devi, the Lord subsequently informed other ladies of his departure by entering the palace of Hastinapura. But upon preparing to leave, he was stopped by King Yudhisthira, who implored him lovingly. Hmm. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. No one can make Lord Krishna stay at Hastinapur when he decided to start for Dwarka. But the simple request of King Yudhisthira that the Lord remain there for a few days was more was for a few days more was immediately effective. This signifies that the power of King Yudhisthira was loving affection, which the Lord could not deny. The Almighty God is thus conquered only by loving service and nothing else. He is fully independent in all his dealings, but he voluntarily accepts obligations by the loving affection of his pure devotee. Bodhis. Om Agyam Timirandasya Gena Jena Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manopistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kedam Mayam Dadati Swapadantikam Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Srivasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai So please give me your blessings so I can say something that will be relevant to what is being explained here and beneficial for others. Maharaj, Hare Krishna, thank you for blessing the assembly. Hare Krishna. So, mm, Prabhupada speaks on this verse. I was listening to the lecture Prabhupada was speaking this morning, and it's interesting. He starts off by speaking about Hastinapur, about the king that is actually the capital of the world. And he goes on to explain that in those days there was only one head of state or head of the world, actually. And at that time, of course, it was King Yudhisthira. And Prabhupada goes on for a long time just talking about the present situation in the world, how there are so many kings, so many kingdoms, and everyone is fragmented or from us pretty much fixed on their own kingdom. And there's always rivalry, there's always contention, there's always threats of wars. But here, of course, there was a war, and that war was uh, what was the the desire of the Lord to establish saintly rule upon the planet. And that was successful. And King Yudhisthira was the personality to take the position of leading the world. Now, and Prabhupada goes on to explain, you know, how the world was known in those days as Ilavati Varsha, then it became Bard Varsha. Now we have so many different kingdoms broken up into different sections. And so he gives a little bit of a geography of the past and the present, and describing the situation in a political and social way. And here we see, you know, Krishna has been successful <laughs> in a sense in establishing King Yudhisthira on the throne. And now the Lord is about to depart for Has for Dwarka, actually. And uh, Prabhupada explains that the Lord is completely independent. <laughs> he's he's Atmaram, he's self contained and he is independent, he's Swarat, he's fully Swarat. That means that he does whatever he wants, whenever he wants, and no one can check him. And whatever he does is beneficial for everyone. So he's not only independent, but he's all good. But still, he acts for his own understanding of what is the importance. He acts for everyone, but he acts also has his own desires. So now he wants to leave. But somehow he is stopped. <laughs> 
But no one can stop him. And Prabhupada explains that, you know, the Lord, you know, he he's all powerful. And therefore, no one can check the Lord in anything. But still, there's an element of checking. But that element is not a checking thing. It is actually something that is desirable by the Lord itself, himself. And that is, when love comes his way, he's attracted by that love. So Prabhupada said, no one can capture the Lord except by love. And when that love is pure, that capture is complete. So the Lord becomes subservient to the love of his devotees. And here, it says, King Yudhisthira, he had that love and he begged the Lord. And the Lord could not refuse. Of course, it mentions in another place that the Lord also used that opportunity to pacify his... Um, his sister Subhadra, who lost her son Abhimanyu in the battle. So he took another opportunity to show her some affection, some kindness, and take time to spend with her also. But here it mentions King Yudhisthira. And what is this, this loving affection? It is the foundation for the, the whole activity of bhakti. Bhakti actually means love. And what is love? Love means to to act for the benefit of others in such a way that that will please that personality. Srila Rupa Goswami gives us the understanding in uh, in uh, Nectar of Devotion. He says, Ayabila Sita Sunya, Jnana Karmana Abhitam, Anukulena Krishna Silanam Bhakti Uttama. So this is the philosophical understanding of how the process of bhakti is actually understood in its expression of perfection, to give up any other personal desire other than to act on behalf of the Lord for the pleasure of the Lord. <laughs> uh, that is pure devotional service. And it's, of course, it's illustrated in Bhagavatam, Savai Bhum Sam Paro Dharma, Yato Bhakti Ahoksaje Hoituki Apriyata Yayatma Suprasiditi. That loving devotion becomes what we say fully uh, unimpeded when it is without cessation and when it's out personal motivation. And that is bhakti. So bhakti is described so much throughout the, the shastras. What is the effects of bhakti? Bhakti satisfies both the, the ex one who exhibits bhakti and the object of that bhakti. So it's perfect for both. Just like it is explained in the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, that but when one takes food, automatically three things happen by the ingestion of food. And what is that? One becomes, the hunger one becomes satisfied. Um, one receives nourishment from the food. And also one becomes, what we say, happy or yeah, and one relieves hunger, one feels satisfied, one gets nourishment. So in the same way, bhakti works to to destroy our desires for material happiness or material success, material adventures. It uh, awakens our natural love for Krishna, and it brings about a joyful expression, a feeling, joyful feeling. And this is bhakti. So we understand philosophically what is that bhakti, but, but then again, but what, how to exhibit bhakti? <laughs> how, what, how is it bhakti exhibited in such a way that it becomes, uh, what we say, expression of perfection? Of course, it is natural for the living entity to love or to show affection. And so we show affection in so many ways to different objects in this world. Sometimes that objects even become inanimate objects, such as things that we like to use and enjoy. But that's not bhakti. It looks sometimes it looks like that. Some people say, "Well, I love my car. I love my computer. <laughs> you know, I love my cell phone." That seems to be the most formidable form of love right now: cell phone. So there's so much love to inanimate objects, and of course, people express love to others, such as family members, friends, society, and people in general, in so many different ways, by acting in such a way as to do something for them. 
So you cannot stop the element of bhakti. It's there within the heart, and it comes out in different forms of expression, in different relationships. But it is naturally expressed in its purest form when it's, the, when it's shown towards the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Nitya Siddha, Krishna Prema Sadhu Kabunoi, Sravanadi Siddhi, Chitte, Kodi, Oi Udoi, in the hearts of all living ba- li- entities, the principle of love naturally exists. There, everyone is looking for love, everyone is looking for to show love, everyone is looking to receive love from others. But that becomes perfectly expressed and fully satisfied in all the participants when it's directed to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Then again, how is bhakti exhibited? In different ways. The more we hear about the Lord, the more we become attracted to the Lord. Because the Lord is by nature Krishna. He's Krishna means he's all attractive. Everything about him is attractive. And everyone is attracted to him naturally, but that covering of the material energy and the association of that energy in such a way as to try to manipulate or enjoy that energy causes us to forget that natural loving attraction or to be that natural loving attraction to be covered by this external energy. But it becomes gradually destroyed and removed through the process of hearing more and more about Krishna. So that's why it says, Satam prasangam mama viryasam bido bhavanti ritkarna rasayana kata. That when we hear the glories of the Lord, particularly and especially in association of devotees, that natural loving attraction to the Lord naturally awakes. And one wants to only hear more and more. So that taste to develop love for Krishna actually comes by hearing about the Lord. And then, of course, the process of hearing leads to the process of glorifying or speaking about the Lord. So, but how is that executed? And Rupa Goswami gives us the formula. It has to be done enthusiastically. So what is that enthusiasm? Sometimes enthusiasm is defined as some emotional expression. But actually enthusiasm is understood and defined by the great souls as to carefully follow the principles of bhakti as given by the the spiritual master and by the acharyas. In other words, when we follow the instructions of the spiritual master and execute those instructions, we actually develop the element of enthusiasm. So this is where bhakti actually starts and develops by carefully, we can't say that I am developing love for Krishna, but I don't follow anybody. <laughs> I don't follow any instructions. I don't follow, you know, I have natural love for Krishna. Yes, if you're on that platform, then all glories. But to get to that platform, especially in this age of Kali, we have to cut through all this material uh, attachments and coverings and also what we say affections that cover that natural bhakti. So hearing about Krishna, especially uh, following those instructions that lead to the process of hearing more and more about Krishna. When Srila Prabhupada was in Atlanta, Georgia in 1975, he was giving uh, a lecture to devotees who had come to meet him from all over the United States. It was one of these events where Prabhupada was coming and everyone wanted to see Prabhupada. <laughs> and so devotees had come from various parts of the United States to see Srila Prabhupada. And Prabhupada was there for about five days, giving very, very powerful lectures. And in one uh, lecture, Prabhupada took a lot of questions, and he was answering questions one afternoon. You can hear it. I think it's mm, February 28th, 1975. And uh, then one of the questions towards the end of the class, or towards the end of the discussion was, Srila Prabhupada, what pleases you most? And the question was obviously, and you can tell by the way it was expressed, it was insinuating a certain answer. <laughs> the person who was said it was thinking, I know what Prabhupada's going to say. I just want to hear him say it to confirm it. But 
it, what, what it was, was he was a book distributor. And it were, the temple was full of book distributors at the time. So obviously the answer was going to say, Prabhupada was going to say, you know, distribute my books. Jai, Prabhupada. <laughs> but he didn't say that. <laughs> when you try to second guess the spiritual master, you're always wrong. <laughs> Not sometimes. <laughs> There's many stories related to that, how everyone sort of has this understanding, oh, this is what he's going to do, and this is what he says, he does the opposite. <laughs> it's just the way, because, you know, Krishna shows you, you, you know, you shouldn't try to, you know, prejudge or try to understand pre presumptuous, presumptuously. Anyway, Prabhupada's answer was interesting. And it was the foundation for our whole process of bhakti. And he made it very clear and succinct. He said, what pleases the spiritual master most is that you love Krishna. <laughs> that was the answer. <laughs> and then it was, you know, it was understood. That's the, the spiritual master has come here to help us come to that platform of pure love for Krishna. Everyone has love for Krishna. There's not, no question in that. But the, the living entity cannot be fully satisfied unless they reach to the stage of pure love. Satisfaction does not come until love becomes complete. And love is complete and developed the more and more we hear about Krishna, the more we, we chant the glories of the Lord. So this enthusiasm to hear about Krishna is the what we say the elixir or the catalyst for developing our attraction to hear about Krishna. And then Krishna teaches us in various ways through his own words and through the words of the spiritual master, what are the, what are the principles of bhakti that help us develop that pure love? So in the Nectar Devotion, there are 64 rules and regulations for practicing bhakti. And of course, some of them apply only to India in certain cases, but most of them apply all across the globe. But then again, when you read all 64, you think, can I follow all these? <laughs> so Krishna, although Rupa Goswami makes these 64 items available, some of the things we should do, and some of the things we should avoid, the vidyas and the nishedas. But Krishna sort of summarizes it up. And I like to read this particular verse that's spoken by Krishna in the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, in the 19th chapter, where Krishna summarizes those 64 into 15. He breaks them down into 15. And he's speaking to Uddhava. In the previous verse, he says, O sinless Uddhava, because you love me, I previously explained to you the process of devotional service. Now he's saying it again. Now I will again explain the supreme process for achieving loving service to me. And then Krishna explains within five verses, what is that? What are the activities of pure devotional service? Firm faith in the blissful narrations of my pastimes. One, constantly chanting my glories. Two, unwavering attachment to ceremonial worship of me. Praising me through beautiful hymns. Great respect for my devotional service. Offering obeisances with the entire body. Performing first class worship of my devotees. Conscious, consciousness of me and all living entities, offering of ordinary bodily activities in my devotional service, use, use of words to describe my qualities, offering the mind to me, rejection of all material desires, giving up wealth for my devotional service, renouncing material sense gratification and happiness, renouncing material sense gratification and happiness, and performing all desirable activities such as charity, sacrifice, chanting vows, and austerities with me, 
with the purpose of achieving these. These constitution, constitute actual religious principles by which those human beings who have actually surrendered themselves to me automatically develop love for me. What other purpose or goal could remain for my devotee? So Krishna summarizes those uh, 64 into the 50s, 15 activities which make up the essence of pure devotional service. But, and then again, it is explained that there are nine angas of devotional service. Hearing about Krishna, chanting to Krishna, remembering Krishna, worshipping Krishna, and becoming a friend to Krishna, serving the Lord in his archivigra form, um, uh, surrendering everything to the Lord, becoming a servant of the Lord, worshipping the Lord's lotus feet. So all these different activities make up the process of devotional service. But unless one actually develops that mood of devotional service, which means to do everything to please Krishna. Prabhupada says before you can actually love someone, you have to know about them. No one can actually love someone who they don't know about. So the more you love, the more we know about Krishna, the more our, our natural love for Krishna becomes awakened. So it just comes down a lot of times to a question of time. How much time do we give Krishna? <laughs> we have only so many responsibilities with our other activities in the world, with family responsibilities and bodily needs, so many other things, occupational activities. So the question is, as one develops attraction for Krishna more and more through the process of hearing Krishna, it is naturally to give more time to Krishna. Sometimes people come to me and they say, Maharaj, I'm in trouble. I say, what is that? You know, the more I get into devotional service, the more I lose my taste for my, my material life. What am I going to do? I said, congratulations. <laughs> But there's a little fear that, that, you know, that, do I have to give up more of my responsibilities? I basically try to answer them depending on the nature of the person's emotional expression, <laughs> how, how much they're actually, uh, what we say, feeling the pains of, you know, I'm, I'm growing in devotional service. My attraction is that what's, what's happening around me? <laughs> You know, I don't have that same attraction to do the things that I used to do with my friends and my family members. In fact, I think it's boring. <laughs> I don't even want it anymore. What am I going to do? I have to do it, but I don't want to do it. I said, do it and do it for Krishna. Then. <laughs> Try to Krishnaize your, your life in such a way that you can see, as Krishna says in these 15 narrations, to try to see me within the hearts of all living entities as one of the principles of bhakti. Seeing Krishna in the hearts of all living entity means actually serving that living entity accordingly. And then that is actually service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So this process of bhakti is very deep and very extensive. But sometimes it's, sometimes it's explained very simply. As Krishna Prabhupada would say, bhakti is just easy. Patram pusram phalam toyam yome bhakti panachyati Taraham bhakti uparitam asnami payatat manaha. Just give me a leaf, a flower, a fruit, and water with bhakti, and that's then I will accept. And Krishna's not what we say just patronizing us, he's actually means that. That's the bhakti he really wants. But then Prabhupada goes on to say, but if you're wealthy and you have big mansions and you're giving Krishna just some sugar cubes and some peanuts, then uh, what are you eating? <laughs> so, so then that's another thing. <laughs> I love you, but you know, therefore you, you'll accept whatever I say, whatever I offer, because I love you. But then love, love is also understood as sacrifice. Where, where sacrifice it starts, love actually starts to begin. So making some effort to take on some difficulty for Krishna is an expression of our love for Krishna. 
So it, sometimes it's difficult to spend more time in hearing and chanting and going to programs. Sometimes it's more difficult to neglect the things we like in order to perform, when we say, more and more time for devotional service. Sometimes it's difficult to go out in books and distribute books or to preach or to do all these things. But these are expressions of love. These are expressions of love because they please the spiritual master. When Krishna is, Krishna is pleased when the spiritual master is pleased when we enthusiastically follow the instructions. So it's a great science here. And because you, King Yudhisthira had such a natural affection for the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He based his whole kingdom on serving the Lord. And he, he gave his whole life to serve the Lord. And whatever the Lord wanted, he, he became his order supplier. So King Yudhisthira was completely sold out to Krishna in, in loving affection. So when Krishna wanted to leave, he was stopped by love. <laughs> So Prabhupada said, this is what it takes to attract the Lord, because he is bhaktivatsal. He is only attracted by our loving uh, relationships. So love is natural, but love has to be practiced according to the principles given to us by the spiritual master. And the more we practice, that natural love starts to awaken. Then when we see the deity, we don't see the deity, we see Krishna. <laughs> We actually see the deity. Krishna's there in the deity, Arche Vichu Sila Di. He's there, he's non different from the de his deity form. He's fully there in the deity, he's fully there in the holy name. He's fully there in, in uh, hearing and chanting his glories. He says that, and he says that in one particular verse. Uh, what was it? Naham. Nistami Narada, he's talking to Narada Muni. And he he's glorifying the process of how to receive him. And he says something quite interesting, which is somewhat not true. Can speak, Krishna speak something that's not true? Mm, but he's speaking something that is what we say. Um, it's true. But he's making a, a point by saying something that apparently is not true. What does he say? I'm not in the heart of the yogis. You can't find me there. I'm not in Vaikuntha, in the spiritual world. Don't look for me there. You want to find me? Find me wherever my devotees are there glorifying me, with chanting my glories. So he is in the heart of the yogis. He's in everyone's heart. He's also in the spiritual world. But he says, well, if you want to eat, find me, this is where you'll find me. Wherever my devotees are hearing and chanting my glories, then I am personally present. Like that. We have the story of Lord Jagannath, and how when Rohini was narrating to all the queens in Dwarka the pastimes of Lord Krishna in Vrindavan, and how it was important that Krishna not come and hear. He was there. He was also present in Dwarka at the time, along with Balaram and Subhadra. And so there was a guard. Actually, it was Subhadra Maharani who was guarding the door. So if Krishna would come, Rohini would stop the narration. Because if Krishna heard his own glories, he would become so attracted to leaving Vrindavan uh, leaving Dwarka and going to Vrindavan, and that would be, what we say, heartbreaking for all the residents of uh, Dwarka. But when uh, Rohini was chanting, somehow or other, Subhadra, she, she couldn't absorb herself. She was absorbing herself so much that she actually lost consciousness in ecstasy hearing the glories of Krishna and Vrindavan and nobody was guarding the door. What to do? So then Balaram comes, he hears, and he also becomes overwhelmed, he faints. And, and Krishna says, oh, they're chanting my, they're talking about me. So let me come and listen. If someone's talking about you in a nice way, isn't there there's an inclination to want to hear about that? Hey, what did they say about me? Whoa, really, that's nice. 
You might, it's not false pride, it's just natural. <laughs> it's natural if somebody's saying not something nice to you, about you. You want to hear it, and just to, you know, that way you appreciate that person more and there's a nice, written, that develops a stronger relationship with that person. So that's just natural. So Krishna's Prabhupada says, Krishna likes to hear his glories. <laughs> so, therefore, just by glorifying Krishna, he's pleased. But then the essence of that glorification is that it awakens our love for Krishna. And the more and more we hear and chant the glories of the Lord. So this verse is, is quite fundamental to the process of devotional service. Then I'll ask you a question which might kind of like help us to understand a little bit more about the process of bhakti. You ready for the question? It's easy. He had two answers. <laughs> uh, and Prabhupada says both. And you have to determine which one of the ones is the right answer because he says both. He says the process of bhakti yoga is very simple, very easy. But then again, he also says the practice, process of bhakti yoga is difficult and very hard to execute. So then, what is it? Apparent contradiction. And Prabhupada poses the same question in one verse in Srimad Bhagavatam in the fourth canto, in the pastimes of Narada Muni instructing Dhruva Maharaj. So in that, he, he says, and, and, and some say bhakti is, is easy, and some say bhakti is very difficult. So what is it? So, who says it's easy? <laughs> okay. <laughs> we got a few. That means you've really achieved it. Right? Who says it's difficult? <laughs> okay. I put up two arms. <laughs> if I had four, I would put them up too, but <laughs> I'll just put up two. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it appears to be quite arduous sometimes in executing bhakti. There seems to be so many... Uh, De deterrence and obstacles, difficulties. And that's there. That's not something just theoretical or imagined. Obstacles, difficulties are there. But Prabhupada gives the answer. And what is the answer? He says, for those who are determined, it is easy. For those who are not determined, it is difficult. <laughs> so then he makes that point. Determination, Rupa Goswami em emphasizes Utsaha nishchaya. Nishchaya means to become determined. And how do you become determined to execute the devo devotional service? So that's a whole other subject. What is determination? How to develop determination? And that is explained in different ways that one of the most effective ways is to associate with devotees who have that determination. And through that, what we say, association of observing them in their devotional service, it helps for you to awaken that determination within yourself. But again, again, there are more to, uh, elements to developing determination. And the main one in terms of our, is to give up sense gratification, give up material sense gratification. Those who try to uh, add or keep sense gratification with bhakti, can never be determined in the course of bhakti. Gradually, if one doesn't give up the desire for material sense gratification, then that will overshadow one's, one's execution and devotional service in due course of time. So Krishna is very patient and allows us to execute devotional service whatever our state of consciousness is. So therefore, the, those 64 rules and regulations also include relinquishing or detaching ourselves from various material activities which take our attention and determination away from uh, devotional service. And the main one that destroys devotional service is criticism. More than anything else, criticism, especially of Vaishnavas, will destroy devotional service fast or in the, also de so destroy our determination fast. So one should very carefully, that's why Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, I give my full mercy to anyone who chants the holy names of the Lord and does not find fault 
with others. <laughs> That's a statement in Chaitanya Bhagavad by, by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So he makes two points, one to do and one to avoid. So it is natural to be critical sometimes, and we find that actually throughout the scriptures there is criticism, but it's directed towards that which is against devotional service. But it's done in an, in an intelligent way as a means for purifying one's consciousness and detaching oneself from the process of devotional service. But when it's directed in a mean-spirited way and towards other living entities, it blocks our, our progress in devotional service. So when we study the whole process of devotional service, we find that it's so very intricate and very deep very complicated, yet it's quite simple also. It's both. So what is the simple part of it? Chant Hare Krishna and serve the Vaishnavas. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu emphasized these two things more than anything. Become das, anudas, in other words, find ways to serve other devotees and the spiritual master, of course, and chant the holy names. And that's why Krishna mentions in that 15 listings of bhakti, he says, constant chanting of, of my glories. So constant means always. So to practice that state of devotional service means to actually develop one's attraction for Krishna, like that. What does they say in Bengal? Hate koro kaje, muki bolo hori. Work with your hands, whatever you're doing, Chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> Always chant. There's that story of how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was so pleased with one little boy. It goes on in uh, in Jagannath Puri where one, it doesn't mention the person's name, but this was a great soul. And he was addicted, or you might say habituated, addicted to chanting the holy names always. He couldn't stop. <clears throat> he had developed that attraction. Now he's on his way to take care of nature, and he's going to a very, what we say, unpleasant, filthy place. So he's thinking, oh boy, the holy name is Krishna, it's so pure, how can I take this holy name into a place that is so, what we say, abominable? Therefore, I have to figure out some way not to chant. But because he was so oh, absorbed in chanting and couldn't think of how to stop himself from chanting, he decided to use some mechanical means. So he grabbed his tongue and he was trying to hold it. And he's walking. One young boy, his name was Gopal, and he was 10 years old at the time. He said, hey, Baba, what are you doing? <laughs> Something like that. And he said, well, you know, and he explained his situation. The boy said, the holy name is pure. It's antiseptic, prophylactic. It cannot be contaminated by anything. So therefore you can chant anywhere and everywhere. You'll remain pure and the holy name is never affected by anything. And Mahaprabhu just happened to be there listening to that. And he said to the boy, my dear boy, what is your name? He said, my name is Gopal. Lord said, ah, very nice. You are speaking perfect knowledge, perfect philosophy. Therefore, I give you the name Gopal Guru. And later on, that same personality became Gopal Guru Goswami, which was the spiritual master of Vakreshwara Pandit, one of the most intimate associates of Lord Chaitanya. And so <clears throat> just by, by, by pleasing the Lord, by glorifying the holy name, he received the full blessings of the Lord. So how important is our chanting of the holy names? Okay, so any comments or questions?